All right, in continuing with assignment two, you know, understanding sketching and then understanding how to find reference based on the understanding of your sketch. Uh, we're going to start there, but I wanted to share with you like the most important things about learning digital art because it's not about making amazing images. It's about learning as much as you can about it. So we have some class rules, just three of them, just to remind you of what matters in this class, right? As we get stressed out working on artwork, you want to be willing to work actively during class time. So some content, my boys do way too much of this, they just expect to absorb. So they'll watch YouTube documentaries and just let the knowledge pour over them, right? But to learn a skill, and that's what this class is about, knowledge, skills, and abilities in digital art. It's a studio class. You need to be doing it with your hands. What's called critical making, not just critical thinking. So even if you're making mistakes, you want to be working actively, trying to do the things that you're trying to do. Not thinking that it's all going to make sense after you've seen people do it. So that's my little, just remember, always be hustling. Always be working towards it. Along with that, you need to be willing to mess up, right? You're going to mess up a lot. One of those advantages of digital art is as long as you're organized and you're saving your work, you can mess up a ton and still not lose pro progress, right? And sometimes when we mess up, like a few of you, like in every class, have already had to start projects over, have lost your data, had to do it all from the beginning, that's actually when you learn the most because you're really paying attention that second time through <laughs> to not do the thing that, that cost you so much time. So just like professional wrestling, like sometimes you got to take the hit, but it's all part of playing the game. And then the third rule, all of these are about your willingness, right? You have to be willing to ask for help, not when the teacher like asks you if you need help, or it doesn't look like you've done much, <laughs> you know, how can I help? But you got to ask for it as soon as you hit a roadblock and you're stuck. Or as soon as there's something you're confused about. And that confusion can come from lots of places. That confusion can come from, you know, you weren't able to look at the videos or you weren't able to, to keep up with what we were doing. So even though you know the instructor just told everyone how to do it, you still want to ask if you don't know how to do it and it's keeping you from moving forward. So you have to put all pride aside when you're trying to learn creative skills, right? Because we're all just trying to, to do our best work. So to review, be willing to work actively. Be willing to mess up in order to learn more. Be willing to ask for help as soon as you need it. If you do those things, you will not need to work outside of class time more than you want to. The only time you would work outside of class time is because you really want to make it something special. This class is not about making super special finished artworks because it's an intro studio class. To do that, you need to put in your own time. What this class is about is exposing you, introducing you to these skills and hopefully engaging you enough with them, getting you curious so you do invest and work more on them for yourself. But we do a lot of projects. Not all of them are going to be what you want to invest in and that's fine so out of eight finished assignments we do for the semester only five of them are needed for your final portfolio and it might be this one right it might be our creature design so if that's something you're interested in, in learning a lot about then be willing to invest the time and the questions and remember as long as you meet the deadlines with something you can always resubmit for full credit until the very last day of our semester. And these skills get easier with practice, a lot easier. All right, so let's go right to it. Not assignment one, sorry. So we are in the next assignment. So if you click on assignments from the homepage, it's kind of a shortcut to where we post these things. This is our composite creature. We looked at the professional example you know, when I introduced the project, it's in our videos of how this is used professionally. There's also a professional example of how compositing landscapes is used professionally for two different artists. And these are both fine artists. Uh, 
RJ Parma is more a commercial artist, does concept work for, for film and for video games. Right? And it all has to do with understanding the structure that goes into the design. And I got to meet um, Crash McCurry, who did all the concept and creature designs for the original Jurassic Park movies. And he just did them all with a mechanical pencil. But you start in the exact way this is shown digitally. You start with the skeleton, <laughs> and there's a lot of dinosaur bones out there. But that doesn't mean he just took those dinosaur bones. He adapted them. If you're a fan of Jurassic Park and you know what the dinosaurs actually look like, you can see how much he adapted them to make them more compelling. Like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park does not look as chunky as this one. Right? This is trying to be a more accurate and now, of course, it would have feathers. So, you know, we're always changing what our silhouettes might look like. Okay, but going to the composite creature, you can skip right to where we post it. Because we are in the process. So I mentioned how you can find something to be your inspiration. And I really love Pokemon, especially early Pokemon designs, because their silhouettes are so strong. So even as just a black cutout, you can understand the anatomy of that creature. And good creature design, whether it's for video games, whether it's for feature films, whether it's for animation, if I think of it this way, when I'm introducing the character, just their shadow hits a wall, right? And just their shadow hitting the wall, maybe it's Yu-Gi-Oh, maybe it's Charizard, right? You should be able to already have an idea of what that creature is all about just from its shadow. That's how important silhouette is to concept creature design. And it has to do with vehicle design, has to do with prop design, everything. Okay, then inspired by that, just a review of last, last class uh, in the last video, we want to be inspired by these things, but that doesn't mean that we're a slave to them. We're going to sketch and understand their anatomy, like I did here. Just understanding the ma major components of the skeleton. This is called the skeletal template. Once we have that, then we look for references. So now... I'm using my sketch, I have ideas about what to look for, and I start finding things like this that are high quality reference, at least a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels, not for the whole image, for the thing I want to use, right? So you don't want to use references that just have a tiny little part of the photo has the animal you want. You want large, in focus, clear reference. And then we're going to be Cutting those out, just like we did with our landscape, fusing them all together into our creature. It's going to look rough by the end of today. Hopefully we'll get to about this step by the end of today. But then we'll smooth it out, clean it up, and it will just get better and better. So here's my skeletal sketch, my skeletal template, based on this Pokemon, which my boys were saying... Um, drops boulders on things. And I might want to do something weird with its front, right? I don't want to just do a, a stork. So I had some ideas here, and then when I went to Pixabay and started looking for different references, because I was thinking maybe crocodile teeth, you know, I found this reference, and then you download it at the highest quality you can. If you don't want to sign in, go for the second to highest. It won't force you to sign in. But make sure it's all clean and sharp, like that, right? Now, what's another thing I could look up? Uh, the legs. What kind of legs do I want for this? I can just look up bird legs. <laughs> See what Pixabay gives me. Now, the tough thing with legs... I'll right click and open it in a new tab so I can go through a lot. The tough thing about legs is it's really hard to find photos of animals where you can actually see their feet unobstructed by ground or by water. So sometimes you have to composite the feet from different creatures, right? But looking at your sketch, seeing how these legs are centered underneath, because I want this to be a standing creature. I don't want to show it flying. Uh, this chicken actually has pretty good reference. So really pay attention to the things you need. And then ostriches are good. They have really strong feet. Uh, 
And so it's all about kind of what kind of reference you can get. So grab, you only need five or more, but grab more than you need for sure. And when you download them, they go to your downloads folder. All of these are high quality. You can go to Google Images. You'll find a lot, but you're going to spend a lot of time quality checking them. And so Pixabay, to me, is, is the better option. You might even find legs that uh, make you want to change your pose a little bit. Like I love how the one foot is up. It really showcases it better. Okay. So then I'll get these different things, download them. And now I try to be organized. So I have an assignment to folder and I have a references folder. I'm going to bring all those things from downloads into that folder. I need things for the wings. I was actually thinking it might be fun to use like a honeybee as the chest, the furry part. And I thought it might be fun to add uh, some flora into it as well. Because you can use vegetables, you can use pine cones, you can use flowers. There's lots of good reference of these things. And then the best wings I found are actually seagull wings. Like that's really nice and sharp and it matches the angle of the anatomy that I need. All right, so I got a lot of references. Now I'm ready to get working on the project within Photoshop. So I'm going to keep my reference sketch open, the one I posted to Canvas. I recommend all of you post your reference sketch to Canvas. Whether you're proud of it or not, that's how we start. Yep, you just take a photo of it, put it into Canvas. Yep, yeah, whatever works. I just use my phone and then I use Google Photos. Okay, now I'm going to open up that sketch image in Photoshop. So since I sketched it digitally, it's already in Photoshop. And then just like we did for our landscape, I'm going to crop down to it just to a nice shape around my creature. So if your creature is taller than it is wide, you're going to have a rectangle that's a little taller than it is wide, and vice versa. Let me flatten it. OK, now I'm going to use my Move tool, just like we did last assignment. And I'm going to put guides on all four sides of my creature. I want to show this creature design from head to toe, not cropped off at all, right? Because we're going to be placing this into different environments when we're done. Then I want to go to image size, and I need to make sure that this pixel resolution is big enough for printing. And so I'm going to make it the smallest dimension here, which is 3.47. I'm going to make that at least 8. And because we're using Photoshop and it's powerful, I'm going to go up to 10 inches. And so my image is 10 by 10.8. And I would recommend, like if I put 8 there, it would actually be smaller than 8 by 10, right? It would be 8 by 8. So that's why you want it to be at least 8 by 10. Bigger is, is fine, as long as it's not too much bigger. And then by what resolution? 350. 350 that's our, our studio resolution. A little bit better than standard minimum for printing. It's going to blur everything out. That's fine. Not a big deal. Okay, now, just like before, I need to give myself space for my collage elements, space to work. So what I'm going to do is say image canvas size, and I'm going to make this, do you guys remember? What dimension? Nope, because this is for the extra space around that will get cropped down. It's the largest size that a, a professional printer, printing press can accommodate. Yes, it's 40 inches by something. 